And a lot of these issues were discussed before. If you look at the 60s and the 70s, you had, obviously you had heavyweights like Muhammad Ali and, and Malcolm X, intellectual heavyweights. Um, you had James Baldwin, a little bit lesser known, uh, but no less eloquent uh, in his passion against injustice. In one of his, in one of his interviews, he's, he was debating with someone who was an optimist. And at the end of, a, of this person's uh, you know, positivity, Baldwin simply says, you know, everything you just, you just said, quote, I don't see it. I don't see any of it. Now, the difference between then, of course, you have the church committee. Uh, I think Rockefeller at one point also headed the, headed the commission against corruption. The difference is that now we don't see that anymore. Um, you know, you don't have a Muhammad Ali. The closest equivalent, I can't really, you can't, of course, there's only one Muhammad Ali, but you would think there would be somebody close by in second place. So it isn't. We've had in 2019 or even before then, uh, we had this idea that you would kneel at public sporting events in order to protest police brutality. And remember, the first difference between the past and the, and the present uh, is that Muhammad Ali was protected by the police. He was made into a boxer by Officer Joe Martin of the Louisville Police Department. Fast forward to the present day, that, <laughs> that exact same police department in Louisville just, I think, fired two detectives for some sort of problem with a warrant um, that was delivered either improperly or, or whatnot. Um, Officer Joe Martin, I believe, at one point ran for office and lost. Just think about that for a second, about how entrenched interests have become, even on local levels, if someone that made Muhammad Ali can't get into political office. Look at someone like Hunter S. Thompson. He ran for office, barely, you know, barely lost, but he lost. So you're dealing with razor-thin margins that make all the difference, and that's because of gerrymandering, but also because of all these different entrenched interests that want to hold on to power and force you to build on top of, the, of their existing structure, even if that structure doesn't work and is outdated. <sighs> of course, that's made more complicated because if you think about it from a human level, you know, you've got a mortgage, you've got on a house, you have to make monthly payments. That, that transaction in the aggregate across an entire nation is the foundation of, of the insurance system, you know, because you also pay money for homeowners insurance. And then that, in turn, you know, together, creates the foundation for the banking system in order to invest in maintaining its leadership position worldwide. Um, of course, you know, overall, you know, <laughs> that's on a consumer level. Of course, overall, you've got oil sales, you've got defense system sales. Um, so you've got those country to country transactions. Uh, but in terms of you know, but you know, the oil gets used, right? It, it, when it comes over here, you know, there's this idea that, you know, that, that it promotes just the money flow, right? You know, so that oil comes here, if we don't have a car with it, or, you know, we don't heat the home with it somehow, or with natural gas and so on, you know, those other country to country transactions, you know, they're dead weight, right? So the economy at, on a fundamental level is, is based on the individual. And within the US, that wealth, is for the most part you know, based on you know housing appreciation and the maintenance of housing prices, uh, which are then in turn passed on from generation to generation. And we know that that's a significant factor in, in establishing wealth, uh, simply because we know that the, the people within this country that were subject to slavery and other uh, immoral tactics that prevented home ownership, uh, we know that that, that creates a, a significant difference because just comparing those two groups, the ones that had slavery and the ones that did not, were not subjected to it, uh, the difference in home ownership in this country is, is a 25%, or well, I think well, the non-slave uh, group is about a 75% home ownership level. The slave group is a 50%. So that's a huge gap, right? That's a whole person. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, you've got, you know, those sorts of situations that the reason I'm not optimistic 
is you don't have any sort of comparable, you know, uh, person uh, on the national level and local level, on the local level, it's, it's just, you know, like I said, you know, you've got so much funding going to the police departments uh, that, you know, whereas in the past, you know, you had a situation where the police departments didn't want to lose their best shooters, their best tacticians. Uh, and so they were, for the most part, anti-war. You know, if there was a war in a foreign country, you know, the, you know in, in many cases, you know, you would lose your best police officers, your best, you know, whoever knows how to handle a gun or a weapon, they would get shipped they, they, and who was in good health. Um, and for the most part, those characteristics describe the majority of police departments in, in, in the country. So when, when there was the Vietnam War, you can only imagine how many people in the United States lost. Um, and, wasn't, and, and you had these college students that were getting, you know, PhDs and so on and so forth to avoid being drafted um, or were coming up, coming up with medical reasons. Um, but if you're in a police department, you know, you, I, you know, you can only imagine the overlap and the loss to the community that the Vietnam War and other wars have caused. Um, and so you, when you look at it today, you know, if, you're going to, if you're going to criticize the police department, that is a legitimate criticism. But if the, the way the criticism functions or is being displayed isn't conducive to a resolution. Because, again, if you think about different standards, you know, this local police, this local police department has a different standard for warrants and so on, probably than one 50 miles away. Uh, who was putting all those things together and then who was enforcing it? Well, it's the lawyers, it's the judges. And remember, they're the ones that, was, that have elite positions because they're the ones that are supposed to resolve these discrepancies in a way that makes sense. They're the ones that are supposed to harmonize the enforcement mechanism on the ground floor and provide accountability. So when, when you look at it today, by focusing only on one aspect of the legal equation, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, there is cause for pessimism simply because there is no resolution in sight. And in fact, I've said this before, the, the same problems are going to continue as they have before, despite knowledge of all these problems. So that's the first reason I'm pessimistic. But also, last year, about six months ago, the uh, Asian economies finally got together and signed a trade agreement, including Australia and New Zealand. And so this shift towards regional cooperation, when combined with China's Belt and Road Initiative, is direct evidence of a shift in power away from the West. And it's a significant, you know, because you know, you've got Australia, which is part of a security arrangement with the West, with the UK and the United States, and they signed on. So you, you have this, you know, this trade agreement that now covers a third of the world's economy, just Asia, for the first time. And remember, China's rise was precipitated in 2001 by joining the World Trade Organization. At the same time, the United States was distracted by Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern affairs. So you can see the future happening as you speak, uh, as we speak. Now, so that's the second and, and reason I'm pessimistic as well. And, you know, so we've got those two issues out of the way. What, what I wanted to, what I've neglected to, to discuss before was another issue that, that came up, particularly with respect to the 2016 election. And that was the focus on immigration. Most people agree that illegal immigration to the United States was a flashpoint that caused Donald Trump to win. The Democrats bent over backwards trying to accommodate people, but you know they never quite put the situation in context. By the way, that's what politicians are supposed to do. When there's a problem, they're supposed to bring people together by putting issues in context. And rather than say that this is a problem that has gone all the way back to Bill Clinton and, you know, the Republican Congress, controlled Congress at the time, um, and even farther back between George Bush and Ronald Reagan debating uh, against each other, you know, you, you have a situation where no congressional body has managed to resolve the problem of illegal immigration. And there's no doubt that it makes Congress look weak which then, again, gives rise, paves the way for a strongman or a dictator or some, somebody with, you know, strongman aspirations to rise to power. There's no doubt that's the case. Now, but if you put it in context, it all makes sense. And, we've, and, and, what, and when it makes sense, you start to realize, by the way, that, uh, you know, we've spent too much time discussing immigration. We've spent too much time discussing demographics. 
and in doing so have wasted so much so many so much time that could have could have otherwise been spent on something more productive um you know simply you know just by putting away issues that really don't really belong in the national disc debate uh on any on any level other than you know the, the following the, all empires have illegal immigration because they have a strong currency and so what, what really ends up happening is that the strong currency attracts workers that in turn benefits everybody in that empire because suddenly they're paying less they have more disposable income however it doesn't over time it starts to impact everyone in different ways and unequal ways as some jobs are taken away uh, by people who are able to, to work for less and who are coming precisely to the country uh, for economic opportunity, opportunity and you know, want to send money back home and don't have any other ties to the country. So when you, put out, when you think about it, that's, that's the status of being in an empire, is that you are necessarily in a position where you're going to attract illegal workers. That's been the case with every empire in the history of the world. And the only issue is, you know, how much are, are these people going to work for? And you know, one, of the, one of the issues in the U.S., certainly, that makes us different from other empires, uh, which is a good thing, in my opinion, is that people born in the country are automatically U.S. citizens and therefore have full rights and protections uh, as everyone else. And so, you know, that complicates the issue because it's no longer just a wage and hour issue. It's no longer just an economic issue. It's an issue that forces governments to think long term about who comes into the country. But that's not necessarily what's happened in this country. So the issue again isn't immigration. The issue is a patchwork of different regulations that doesn't understand that immigration, whether legal or, or illegal, is a necessary, is a, is a sine, what is called a sine qua non, a necessary component of every empire. And the only question is how do you create the terms and conditions in a way that doesn't abuse the workers and that provides them with, a, with the country with an, with an opportunity to deport the ones that don't, that don't belong there, as well as keep the ones that should stay there, uh, while also balancing the needs of the workers uh, that the increased immigration impacts. There's been, in my lifetime, so many different things that have been you know, proposed on the state level, on the federal level, retraining, so on and so forth. None of it's worked. Um, you know, I, I was had an opportunity to work at a, at a minimum minimum wage job. There's no question that the you know the, the two best workers uh, were were the convicts. Some of them were on you know get released from jail just to do some work, um, and you know and the uh, the the immigrants. I'm not going to say they're illegal. I don't know, but the one you know I'm sure some of them are. Um, so we've tried to, to do all kinds of things on both sides. We passed a law that said all employers have to input social security numbers into a database. Remember, they're dealing with millions of people, no, tens of millions. Any system can be gamed on that level. You know, it doesn't matter what algorithm you put into it. And so these laws that got, get, kept getting passed to placate both sides without people being told that this is what happens when you're an empire. You have people coming in and looking for work. It, what happened was the other way around. The, the progressives started telling stories about how these low-level jobs, um, you know, how suddenly the economy would stop or be halted overnight if we ended up deporting all of the illegal immigrants. Again, not true. We can probably, it's, it, it's a nice story, um, but it's not true. You know, like in every advanced economy, you know, wages would rise, you know, profits would go down, uh, but wages would probably rise until the supply and demand coordinated with each other. But the fact of the matter is, as my experience shows, nobody really wants to, to do those jobs. That's why you have convicts or criminals doing them alongside with teenagers who are not very, as reliable as you might think unless it's a first-time job. Um, and so <laughs> you look at this thing over, over time, and no one, no politician has really tried to put it in context of, 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 a, of an empire necessarily having this problem that should be made into a, a positive factor to the extent that legislation can be passed that attracts and keeps the best people while at the same time, you know, deporting the ones that uh, are not conducive to the health of the economy or the health of the society. And... <laughs> 
again, the lawyers, again, have, a, have an interest in, you know, this kind of a situation because this, this flux means that the status quo continues, right? A law is passed, you know, people find ways around it, uh, and business goes on as usual. And if you're, you know, like, it just doesn't make any sense to sort of complain about a necessary component of an empire. It's going to happen. The question is, what do you, how do you handle it? And if you spend too much time on it, you end up dividing people that are already in your country. And therefore, you have this balkanization problem that we talked about earlier in a different video. Now, uh, remember, there's no problem with segre segregation initially. If, if you're segregating because the main conduit, the main pillar is corrupt, and you're trying to segregate into a different pillar so that you can maintain the structure better, there's nothing wrong with it. But over time, what's supposed to happen is that the corrupt sector, the pillar is supposed to break, right? As more and more people move on to the st more steady, clean pillar and sturdy pillar, and then eventually everyone gets incorporated under the same pillar. And that's, again, the whole point of having local jurisdictions doing their own thing uh, so that you can find out what the strongest pillars are that maintain the structure. If all you have are new pillars being created that prop up a uh, structure being, you know, being held up barely by mostly broken and, bro and breaking pillars, you can see how that would be a problem. So eventually that glue that we talked about earlier in the other video is also important. It's probably, it's probably, it may be the most important thing is that as you're trying this process of breaking the pillars and creating new ones, you have to, of course, you know, create a system where everything is glued together in a cohesive way. And when you start focusing too much on immigration, either in an honest or dishonest way, either in a way that, uh, that excessively highlights pos the positive aspects of it um, while ignoring the downsides of it, you end up having a broken society. And, you know, that's what happened in this country. We had so many things on the media that, you know, where people would focus on, you know, how this illegal immigrant committed a crime, a violent crime, without, again, pointing out that, you know, actually, that, that, that's, that's a tra it's a tragedy, but, you know, it's not as if there is, you know, it's not as if, you know, the, the issue there is crime. The, you know, the issue there is trying to resolve the crime issue. Um, and criminal activity as opposed to necessarily immigration, which may make things more difficult, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. In fact, you can easily envision a situation where every worker comes in and, and is embedded with a chip, uh, and makes, which makes it easier, right? Because they don't have the constitutional protections as citizens. And, you know, so you can actually violate the privacy, which then, of course, gives you the need for honest lawyers to make sure that the people are not taken advantage of. Uh, under that separate system. And you may end up in a position where the lawyers are facilitating a separate but equal standard, which is one reason why nothing gets done, right? Because people don't want, it's difficult and to, to enforce a separate uh, standard. And, and, I mean, but what, what has happened in this country as I was growing up is that undue focus on immigration and demographics. And rather than trying to understand it in context, and that's been a major problem because it's divided the country along those lines. When in fact, you know, this has been a problem for decades. And it just came to a head you know, in 2016 with the election because the Progressive Party you know, was, was so busy trying to extol the virtues of immigration but without acknowledging the other side's com you know, complaints. And you can see this on both sides. You know, even the Progressives in other countries um, who are trying to protect their own jobs, especially manual labor jobs, are anti-immigration. There are, you know, it's always about protecting the status quo. And so there are lots of in the documentaries where you have a union leader standing in front of a town that's now empty, uh, that's run down, that's, that's abandoned with a lot of empty buildings because uh, once, 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 once upon a time there was a thriving industry and then suddenly it all went, it all went away. Um, as either new workers came in or a new technological standard or a more efficient process was discovered and left elsewhere. And so the argument there is that, you know, the argument there, again, is not about immigration. It's about, you know, do we, how, how badly are we willing to sacrifice future competitiveness in exchange for maintaining, maintaining the status quo? And you have to acknowledge that, uh, that in, in this kind of a system, it's not just creative destruction. That's the issue. 
you know, the issue really has been, you know, how do you create this, this acknowledgement that part of being an empire is being able to exploit cheap labor, not only overseas directly, when you open up a manufacturing plant overseas and then use your stronger currency, uh, you know, in order to hire workers overseas that don't have the same opportunity to have that, to, to have a strong currency. But it's also the idea that that currency is going to allow you to have people coming in that you can also exploit. Uh, and, and if you exploit, if, if, the, if the balance is, is suddenly too far in favor of exploitation, that is the issue to focus on. And then the question is, what rights do these new workers have and what rights do the existing workers have to the extent that there's a conflict? And again, the lawyers have failed. They, whatever they passed it didn't work or it didn't resolve the issue and it's just kept festering and festering and festering until people start segregating themselves to create other pillars that meet their needs. And one day you wake up and suddenly these issues are now, you know, uh, cannot be ignored anymore. But the problem is that, you know, pushing it out into the future has made it almost impossible for most people to understand the context, especially if you have politicians that they them, that themselves don't you know have any direct knowledge of e economic activity because they're either lawyers or they're in acad you know, academia or so on and so forth. And you know that's what's happened in, in this country, unfortunately, is that you know all we had to say was that immigration is a natural consequence of being an empire, and that is what you know allows people to have a higher standard, standard of living overall, but it's based on exploitation. And so if the real question has to be is, at what level are we going to treat people and how are we going to treat people uh, when we know that the status of an empire is in fact the ability to attract workers from all over the world, some of whom are good, some, some, of, them, some of whom are bad. And we never really had that discussion. In order to have that discussion, you really have to have lawyers um, you know, getting together uh, in a cohesive way that glues all these pieces, pieces together and that eventually, uh, you know, puts together a structure underneath a sturdy pillar, underneath a sturdy base that homogenizes different standards and different, you know, and, and closes all the loopholes that allow for excessive exploitation. And it's stunning because there, there, were, there was legislation that was planned, you know, that was passed uh, that, for example, carved out exceptions for farm workers uh, to come in on temporary visas. But again, you know, obviously the security component wasn't really good because the complaint was that a lot of the people would, would work and then stay, uh, overstay the visa. And you, you, you once again, you know, because, and, and, and they had an incentive to do so because of that constitutional right uh, that everyone has in this country to the extent they're born here, of becoming a citizen. And rather than fix sort of the security issue, rather than focus on the long-term issues, you know, we talked about building a wall, which is not gonna work, it's just too long, you know, it's not just the idea of building a wall um, you know, that impacts the, the discussion, it's you have to enforce it, right? Uh, you have to have soldiers or you have to have federal employees across a thousand plus, you know, miles uh, of border, which think about how much, think, think about the cost and what, what we, could, we could otherwise spend that money on. Uh, and think about the opportunities for corruption. Uh, you know, as more and more people simply pay, a, pay people off to, to cross the border, uh, people might create tunnels and so on and so forth, because again, that's the status of being an empire, is that people want to come here and you have an opportunity to steal talent from all over the world. And the question again is, you know, when people start focusing on the downsides of, of just population growth, you know, and they focus on it by focusing on the immigration status of someone else. You don't want to shut down that discussion by calling them racist, which is what happened in this country. And it caused a rift uh, that made communication impossible and, and therefore cooperation impossible. All you had to do was say, you know, you know, this is clearly a problem that's been festering for decades and we, the lawyers, haven't managed to fix it. What we need is to have cooperation across all the different law enforcement agencies in ways that make sense because some people have children here and we don't want to deport, and it doesn't make any sense to deport a, an adult worker with a, and then leave the child behind 
uh, you know, none of these things make any sense. Some people have claims of asylum. Other, some people are claiming that they're fleeing violence. That requires global cooperation, right? Being an empire allows you to go into other countries, sometimes by force, to see whether or not those complaints are legitimate. And, you know, we, we may have to create more global cooperation uh, within our, with our neighbors in order to facilitate the verification of, you know, these asylum claims. And that's a cost. And, you know, the question is, if we're all going to share on this cost, right, the question is, how do we create a system that works? And how do we also make sure that we improve security so that, you know, if, if somebody comes in with a document, uh, that isn't properly vetted or isn't up to a security standard uh, that, that is adequate, again, how do we fix that? And again, the answer is cooperation across borders, which is not something that empires have historically been good at because they haven't had to cooperate. Again, that's what an empire, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the benefit of being an empire is that might makes right. So you don't have to cooperate, at least if you want to be a short-term empire. And here we are. It's just stunning, you know, and, and you have to get down to the nitty gritty and you have to have a system that makes sense. Under the 2016 administra administration, they simply increased the deportations. They increased the funding, they hired a lot of deportation officers, and suddenly you have a situation where now there's even more conflict because now some law enforcement agencies won't cooperate on a local level because they, there's children involved and the voters don't want them to cooperate uh, because of the children involved and of the other externalities involved in a harsh and rigorous enforcement process. Um, which includes, by the way, if you, if you raid someone's home, you've got 15 different people there, perhaps, let's say five different people there, uh, and you only have a warrant for one person. And so you have collateral, you know, you can have a collateral arrest. Do you, do you enforce that collateral arrest even though the warrant is for somebody with a criminal background and no one else in the house has a criminal background? What do you do? You can see how this creates uneven standards which across the, across the country, which then tears the nation apart uh, because there's no consistency and, and, and therefore no adequate leadership. And this wasn't the case. You know, just, just 40 years ago, this was not the case. People acknowledged on the conservative side, right, the same party that voted in, Donald Trump, which increased immigration enforcement dramatically and hiring dramatically, um, you know, that whole process 40 years ago was all about, well, you have people here, once they're in the country, they should be treated the same as everyone else. And that was the idealism that we used to have in this country, at least initially. And, you know, at least with a school system. You know, the question is, you know, should, should the children of illegal immigrants be given access to the school system? And if so, remember, they, may, they don't speak foreign English uh, oftentimes. So you have to have more resources allocated to those people who will, may or may not be U.S. citizens. And so there are, you have to acknowledge that there are costs, but every empire, you know, these are costs that every empire has had to manage. And if they, hadn't, if they don't manage them properly, if they don't manage them cohesively, Every empire that has failed to manage these problems of cohesiveness properly, all of them have broken up, every single one of them. And all of them, over time, have become more aggressive in policing. It's not a coincidence that we're focusing on policing and police brutality with respect to the African-American population. It's a whole culture that has permeated the, the, an institution that used to be honorable, that used to be the same institution that was anti-war, Right, didn't want to lose his best people. The same institution that, that, that fostered Muhammad Ali, a.k.a. Cassius Clay.